mean no one's the first mover. You avoid the disadvantage of anyone going out on that limb alone and paying for the other 49 states. And when you get to the trigger point, suddenly you have half the states or three-fourths the states or whatever the number you pick all at once turning down the federal funds, at which point it becomes a political impossibility for the members of Congress to suddenly have all of their states not paying, paying for it and not receiving it. So it's another example of one of the tools that each of the people in this room that we can do together to fight the expansion of federal power in Washington. And I just, and before we, we've got time for another couple of questions, but I just want to um, pivot off that to say, you know, to, in terms of practicality, you know, you guys are probably going to want to leave here saying, you know, I wish that we had more things that we could go back to our states and do immediately. Well, what I would say is, and we're going to be working on this with our partners to develop specific proposals, just like the reciprocal legislation one, just like the interstate compacts one. But, you know, go back and study the history of interstate cooperation. I mean, we have the New York, for example, the New York, New Jersey Port Authority was created in, in the 1920s. Uh, as a result of a process initiated by the New York State's Legislature's Joint Committee on Interstate Cooperation. <clears throat> it, it would take only one of your states to pass a law to enact a joint committee on interstate cooperation on federalism to set up a mechanism that already has statutory authority and a statutory mandate to begin a process with other states to start exploring the technical details of an interstate compact, of reciprocal legislation on federal funds, of all these different things. The important thing is to start processes that bring us to work together, because like Bob Moffat says, you've got to, when you, when, you know, we've only got one shot on a lot of these things, and we have to cross all our T's and dot all our I's, and we have to be absolutely right in, and make sure that it's going to work what we're doing. But that's, that's where we're headed. So, so one, more, one more question. Two Thank more you. Uh, Ed Sutz, for state representative from Georgia. Uh, to, to the point you were making, a um, couple very simple, short questions. Uh, specifically, um, if you could provide for us what the organizations would be that will allow us to work collectively to dot the I's and cross the T's. Describe to us who that is, what that looks like, so that we're not just, w once we leave Alec, fly back home, get back into our states and start getting a lot of energy behind this, how are we able to hit the mark, hit the bullseye without getting off? That's the first question. Secondly, before you answer that, if you could, if you could describe for us in a little detail um, how the process works within Congress, if a number of states were to come together through a compact, um, how would it move through Congress? Would it, would it be a resolution passed by one body, sent to the other body? Would it, or would it require a supermajority? Um, describe the dynamics within the Congress for, for getting the approvals that you spoke to. Those are, those are both great questions. Um, let, me, let me answer actually in the order in which you asked them. Um, if you look at this document here, which, which were under all the seats, which was an agenda for state action, and it lays out a number of different ideas that we, the states, can do to limit the federal government. And, and the Interstate Compact on, on Health Care is the first one on it. If you look in the back on the sponsoring organizations, you will see that there are a number of free market think tanks throughout the country, and in many of the states represented in this room, that have all come together in a fairly long discussion and effort started through the State Policy Network of trying to work together to bring these ideas so we can work in concert. So that would be one of the first places I would say is working through your state free market think tanks that are working together to coordinate and then also working through the mechanisms of ALEC and we are hoping as a result of this conference uh, the, the sheet that's being passed around that the relationships that are formed here will start building the bridges to form this. I mean, we're breaking new ground on this. Um, the second question you raise about mechanically. Let me just break it really quickly. I'm Bruce Wallace, President of CPPF, and Mario and Ted have all been working together. We are putting the Federal Reserve Act in the Congress and working together with the Congress. Based on that email list that you 
you've all sort of filled out. We'll be building on that, but we're going to start right there. So never fear, you will hear from us again. And if, and if I can just jump in too and say that this, this pay, both of the questions that you just asked are actually treated uh, at some length with examples in the, in the uh, policy perspective on interstate compacts that we did, which is outside on the table if you don't have a comment. Well, and, and the mechanism you asked, as Mario said, it, it is discussed at considerable length at the, the policy perspective that talks about this. The mechanisms historically that Congress has used to approve uh, interstate compacts have either been a law passed by both houses of Congress or a resolution passed by both houses of Congress. They've done it both ways. Now, one legal question that is something of an open question is whether, in fact, presentment to the president is required. Is the president's signature required? The constitutional text of the Compact Clause does not require the president's signature. I think there is, however, a strong argument under the Presentment Clause that it, that it probably is required. And if you look at practice of the interstate compacts that have been proved, approved, historically Congress has presented them to the president for the president's signature. So I think it is, it is likely that the process we will go down, that there's going to be three waves of battles. The first wave is to get an interstate compact adopted among the states with as many states as possible to go after Obamacare and the federal expansion of power over health care. The second wave and, and the real fight is to get congressional approval, and that's going to be a real fight. At a minimum, it's going to take both houses of Congress, so it's not just the House. It's going to take the Senate, and it's going to take a political effort to put members and senators in uncomfortable positions if they vote against it. The third wave is either going to be presentment to the president, which means either unbelievable pressure to get this president to sign it, which I think is probably not going to happen, or number two, in two years, I think there's a chance there may be a different resident at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. Um, alternatively, if Congress makes the decision not to present it to the president, there will surely be litigation and a battle over whether that has the effect of federal law. And, and let me say sort of in summing up, from the perspective of everyone in this room, you know, I would humbly submit that, that an interstate compact on health care is as close to a no-brainer as, as one can find in the political world. And, and I'd suggest it for three, three quick reasons. Number one, it's the principled right thing to do. It is a principled constitutional means for the state to re states to reassert authority and to pull authority back from the federal government and to defend the liberty of our citizens. Number two, speaking just as the reality of people in, the, in this room in elected government, if this succeeds, it will vastly increase the authority of every person in this room and the authority to fight against the federal government and to design public policy solutions that are responsive to the needs and values and wishes of your citizens. And number three, from just a pure, crass political perspective, whoever jumps out front in your states and takes the lead, there is an incredible opportunity to become, as Mark said, a hero to the Tea Party, which more than a few people may have noticed is, is not an insubstantial tidal wave sweeping through this country. So it doesn't always happen in politics, but when you get principle and politics lining up together, all pointing in the same, thing, same direction, that's a very potent convergence. Thank you all very much for coming. Unfortunately, we've run out of time. Wait, it's so quick, it's so quick, please. I'm a Tea Partier, I can't give up. Um, I, I'm with Tea Party Patriots, and I have two questions from members that they really wanted me to ask this. One. Uh, what happens if you get a new state legislature or a new governor? Can they pull your state out of the compact? Yes. And Okay, and second, um, what about folks like Mary Fallon and John Kasich who have said, I totally want repeal, but in the meantime, uh, I'm going to go ahead and start the mechanisms and the exchanges and the, take the, mon the federal money for this. Um, put the, what, fear, what put the fear of God into them. <laughs> yeah. Just so, if you're from Oklahoma or Ohio, just know I just read that. My, my, I just want to add with one point. I would not waste a second doing...